What would you recommend as the um, best practices in terms of mitigation measures and impact of conflicts and the civilian population in general? Ooh, um, <laughs> easy question to answer in 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> yeah. um, so what would I, well one I think, so we talk a lot about prevention, mm -hmm. but actually I don't think we have a framework mm -hmm. for thinking about how we really put preventive measures in place. There's lots of work that's been done that shows the kinds of things that happen in a country in advance of uh, significant conflict uh, breaking out. Um, how you measure countries against that is something that, that we don't really do and say, actually, we need to pay more attention uh, to this country because, the, you know, the rise in hate speech, um, what is happening in terms of uh, the media, I mean, a whole range of factors uh, which you can begin to track will have an impact on the country. Some people will claim that development is sort of like a new cold pan colonialism where people take their sort of perspective and go on to other countries and tell them how it should be. And I mean, like, also looking at the more you development, you also kind of see all the flaws of different approaches. And I'm just wondering, like, as development is now, is it actually is it actually making a positive impact? And how do we even know? So I think it can make a positive impact. I think that there are lots of places and lots of examples where um, it is precisely what you describe. And I remember when I first became um, uh, Secretary of State for International Development here, and this was in 2003, uh, people were very much looking. Uh, to the UK because we had broken, we didn't, we no longer had Tide Aid, yeah? So for, uh, and for such a long time, countries were saying, oh, you can have this money, but you must spend it on products from our country right. and yeah, right. using right. the people from our country. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't development at all. It was, you know, how can we export, you know, either in, in, a, in a humanitarian context, right. um, it was about how can we, as, as, as the Americans do very often, how can we export grain mm -hmm. that's excess, you know, uh, for example, even though it would help the country if you, or the region, if you bought it in the region. Um, and in the case of, you know, other countries, it was you need to take our expertise, mm -hmm. our experts, and you need to take um, our goods and services. So it was about developing that country. Um, and this is a model that we broke away from in the UK. Um, I regret that we are going back towards that. Um, we have not wholesale, but we are creeping back uh, towards that. From your own experience working in all the organisations that you have done, has that, can you describe an example of where your own sort of moral compass or belief system or value system has been at odds with the direction that organisation has taken or decisions made perhaps? easier in government than perhaps in the UN. Um, and what have you done about that? Have you sort of stayed silent and gone with the organization's principles? You all know how difficult it is to get to people who require humanitarian assistance in some parts of the world. And Syria is a very good example of that, where we were constantly having to fight the government. They would say, oh yes, you can bring the aid in if you only give it in these areas which were government controlled areas or you know you could only bring it bring it in once every six months and people were starving into it so they would put conditions on bringing the aid in that were so appalling so i would very often have conversations with my teams where i would say shouldn't we just call this out and say we're not going to do it anymore mm -hmm. that we're not going to be your front mm -hmm. Now, they always argue back at me, and this is the people on the ground, which is at least we're making a difference to some people. Now, this has always been the hardest thing for me, which is, do you keep doing it, and what you're doing is papering over the cracks, but knowing that if you stop, people are gonna die. Yeah. And I don't have an easy answer to that. And in the end, I was always guided by the teams who were working on the ground. Mm. And it didn't only happen in Syria. We did the, we had the mm. same dilemma in South Sudan sometimes and other parts of the world. And you know it all it always 
brought me to the brink of tears because it's do you punish the people mm. and but it's their governments that actually aren't allowing you this that, that i have to tell you that that is always the, the thing that i find the hardest what did you find worked in diplomatic terms in international relations terms to mm. to somehow move that compromise into a different space so it's not these villages are starved or so one you had to work with everybody and I did. I worked with the Russians, I worked with the Iranians, I worked with the Amer I worked with everybody. I worked with the Saudis. But you couldn't always say what you were doing. Um, but also came under tremendous pressure from some governments to, uh, and not just governments actually, I came under pr tremendous pressure sometimes from um, NGOs who wanted me to call out governments yeah. all the time. Um, and I would say no, the relationship is much more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. I had examples where, you know, the Russians helped me, the Iranians helped me, the Americans helped me, and then they would not help me. They would not be helpful in, in another arena or in another decision that they took. Um, so mm -hmm. it, was all the, it was always quite difficult because you were working under the radar in some things and more publicly in others. You know, I had... Um, I, I briefed the Security Council on a very regular basis, so I was able to use that sometimes to call out uh, uh, governments, but you weren't always able to say what you were doing.